about when, when communism fell in Russia, um, the economy was the government. So when, when communism failed, the, the, the economy failed. So these people that had these jobs before, when the government was paying them, they made a decent living. Because the government gave them a house, and it, but, but now all of a sudden, communism fell, and we're all celebrating. They're all over there starving to death. Um, because the job that they had always done, all of a sudden, was paying them like an eighth of, of what they used to get. And they had to make that. But... The last day they were there, they, they wanted to have a, a tea for us. So we all, you know, came into the room and they had tea and some cookies and stuff for us. And those ladies pulled their money together and they all bought us a gift. I remember I got a, a like a tea um, cup, I guess it was, tea cup. And that, that meant so much to all of us because we sat down and realized they're going to have to do without something this week because they offered us a gift. Why is God more pleased with that? Because think about, think about when God gave. For God so loved the world, He gave us what? His only begotten Son. When God gave, he sacrificed. So God is not pleased with the rich who were giving out of their surplus. The lady who gave two pennies. Because when she gave, she sacrificed. So we have to remember, God doesn't look at the external. You know, he doesn't look at the, the number of zeros on the check that you drop in the offering plate. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, God reminds us of this truth. And it, even though he's speaking in a different context and, and really a different situation, but the, the truth of the matter, this is how God always sees differently than we see. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So when Jesus looked at this situation, and him as God in the flesh declared that this woman gave more than all the rich combined, he wasn't looking at the external. He was looking at the heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Beginning in verse 1, we see here Paul, he commends the churches of Macedonia to the church at Corinth. Because of how they had given. To give just a real quick background. The churches in Macedonia were poorer churches. And as Paul was, there was a, there was a great famine that had, that had struck uh, Jerusalem. Just persecution, famine. The, the Christians in Jerusalem and Judea and around that area, they, they, were, they were struck bad. They were, they were, there was a famine and uh, there was persecution. And again, many of these that were, were Jews who converted to Christianity, they, you know, when, you, when, you, when you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and the rest of your family didn't, you were a lot of times kicked out of, the, uh, out of your family, and that meant you were kicked out of your job, your inheritance, you know, everything, all those things were tied with, within families. So the, the church was really hurting. So Paul was going around to all these brand new church plants, and he was taking up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem. The church at Corinth had promised to send a gift. Now, the people at Corinth were wealthy. Corinth was a port city. There was a lot of goods, merchandises coming in and out, so the believers there were well off. They hadn't come through yet. They hadn't given their gift yet. Paul commends to them. He says, look at the churches of Macedonia. Look at how they gave. Verse 1, he says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. 
That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So that the, the churches of Macedonia were suffering. The churches of Macedonia were poor as well. But yet they were, they were generous in what they gave. Verse 3 says, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation and the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Paul says, look at the, look at the churches in Macedonia. He says, they, they're suffering. They are poor, and yet they stepped up to the plate and they gave. And in verse 5, he says, you know what? And, but they did not neglect to give to the Lord first. In other words... They didn't rob from God to give to another cause. They, they didn't take what they would normally give to God and say, oh, something else going on. We're, we're just going to throw it over there in this cap. They were, they were faithful to give to God first. And then they, they gave to support this pulses in their poverty. They gave. See, no part of our relationship with Christ should be done as an external practice of religion. Not even our giving. Not even our giving. You know, it, it's debate sometimes about, you know, is, should a Christian tithe? Tithing is a practice of, of, of the law. Are, are we bound by the law? You know, you can go to Galatians. No, no, it says we're not bound by the law. So, I don't, so you know, are, are we obligated, legally obligated to tithe? I would say we're, we're, we're obligated to give as God has commanded us and pressed upon us to give. Even that part of our relationship with God is not an external 10%, here you go, not even think about it. We need to give by faithfulness. We need to give in faithfulness to God. For you, if that's 10%, that's awesome. If you can't give 10%, but you, you are sacrificing, you are sitting down and planning, you are getting... God is pleased. You can give more than that, and God is pleased. It's not about the external, but it's about the internal heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Now this I say... He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Paul uses a, an agriculture analogy. Um, if you're going to grow a garden, you go out there and be like, yeah, five seeds is enough. I didn't expect to come out there and see just a garden full of, of vegetables and, and fruit and all that stuff. Ain't going to happen. Um, so if you, who's, who's here has ever planted grass seed? Uh, if you've ever tried to get grass seed to grow, well, you you got to plant like 10 million seeds to pray to get like five blades of grass. It, it's just crazy. So you don't go out there and say, you know what, uh, these 10 seeds, man, I'm going to have a lush, or, you know, a lush lawn. And it's the same analogy. We can't expect to, to, to sow little and reap much. Verse 7. He says, each one must do just as he is purposed in his heart. Again, giving with, with a plan, with a purpose. So that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he, he scattered abroad and he gave to the poor and his righteousness endures forever. Now he supplies... No, did I skip verse 8? No. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread... For food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. It's not about the amount. It's about the heart with which we do it. Jesus used that as an example, as a greater example for every spiritual thing in our lives. Anything that we do. God is not concerned about how it looks to others. God is only concerned with how it is between us and Him. 
What is the heart with which we do it? Again, that begins with salvation. A lot of people here growing up, they you know their whole lives, you know, you, you, you gotta you gotta you gotta look like a Christian, you gotta you gotta dress like a Christian, you gotta look a certain way. Look around. A lot of us don't fit that mold. Because it's not about the way things look on the outside. It's about first surrendering your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And once He changes that, then He begins a process of, of changing the outside. If you come back tonight, we're, we're going to look at, there's a graph in there, and I love graphs, and if I would have thought enough about it, I could have had it put up here, but there's a graph that, that shows you know, the difference, that there is that, you know, that change of heart. We call it being saved, or we call it being born again, or we call it regeneration. That is that one-time thing, but then we see the process of the rest of our lives, and that is sanctification. That is God, after He has changed the inside, He slowly begins to change the outside and more, make us look more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ, but that lasts throughout our entire life, that we begin to understand the holiness of God. We begin to understand the righteousness of God. That becomes a process only because of a changed heart through faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What are we trusting in this morning? Jesus said, beware the scribes. They're, they're trusting in what they can do. Jesus says, can't do enough never do enough to earn what can only be obtained by a gift. Do you know that gift of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning? And if you do, man, how, how are we responding to that? How, how is that change hard? How, how is that directing Our steps each and every day. Even after we're saved, sometimes it's easy to say, just give me a list of rules. That way I can just go and just check them off and I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Cool. God says, I don't care about your rules. I care about your heart. Do we have hearts this morning that are fully surrendered to the will of God. I'm going to pray and then we're going to have an invitation. Maybe this morning, salvation needs to be for you more than just coming to church, more than just believing in God, more than just trying to be a good person. Maybe this morning you need to surrender your heart. I'll be here in the front if you want to come. Say, Aaron, pray with me about that. I'd love to do that. Maybe this morning we, God has caused us to kind of take inventory of our Christian lives. Maybe as we pray, God, maybe God has already brought something like, yeah, I don't know, I've probably, I, I may have wandered into, the, in, into the, the world of externalism there a little bit. More worried about what it looks like on the outside, what others think forgot to ask God what he thinks maybe this morning we just want to come and pray and just say God help me get that back on track help me examine everything in my life my surrendering all to you let's pray together Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I know that passages of Scripture like this are sometimes difficult for us. Because it, it causes us to dig a little deeper into our lives than, than what we're accustomed to doing or what we even like to do. But Lord, we all recognize that none of us are perfect. 
And you warned your disciples on multiple occasions of this because you understood the temptation to fall into this line of thinking. Lord, we, we recognize that we're not above that. Lord, I pray that your word would just continue to cleanse and purge those things out of our lives, understanding this is a process. Lord, I pray that this morning that the word of God is doing the work that you've sent it to do. And Lord, we stand on the promise it will not return unto you void. So Lord, use this time of invitation. Help us to, to know and understand that you're not concerned so much about how things look on the outside, but changing us from the inside. Allowing that to flow out. Again, Lord, use this time according to your will and your purpose. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.